in the early 1980s, of Vincent Oswald was one of the first ENT surgeons in the UK to recognise the potential benefit of introducing the laser into clinical practice. He showed how effectively the CO2 laser could cut through tissue and seal blood vessels, thus highlighting the possibility of almost bloodless surgery. He carried out numerous lab bench experiments, including pioneering the use of egg white to visualise the effects of the laser beam when it impacts on tissue. Soon Mr Oswald was not only using the laser in surgical practice to good effect, but also advancing the cause of treating patients with safety. As he developed a flexible metal anaesthetic tube to prevent intra-airway fire. Typically, Vasant then turned his attention to how best to promote the use of laser to other surgeons and share his experience in this new field. So, Vasant, ably supported by his wife Nirmal, set about organising a hands-on laser course which gained international recognition until it eventually closed after 28 years. My own contact with Vasant came about as we both served on the Executive Committee of the British Medical Laser Association. Our relationship grew over the years, particularly in the lead up to the Joint International Laser Conference, which BMLA hosted in Edinburgh. And this involved American, European and British medical laser societies. There's a small cohort of people who have made a truly significant contribution to the advancement of the safe use of lasers in medicine and surgery. I would number Vasant Oswald among this group. I have been following the laser technology since the 70s, but these were mainly experimental models. I saw the commercial model exhibited in one of the international ENT conferences in Budapest in Hungary in 1981. I tried it on an apple, a biological tissue and saw its effects. And I was convinced that this was the technology for the future. So I asked our hospital authorities at the North Riding Infirmary in Middlesbrough in Cleveland, in the northeast of UK, to get a laser for us at a cost of £40,000. And nobody gives you £40,000 just for asking. So I raised the money by public appeal. And to my surprise, in four short months, we had the money. So we installed the coherent CO2 laser, 450 model, the very first one in the country, which had an articulated delivery arm so that it could be coupled to the operating microscope to deliver the energy coaxially. The video cameras were just coming in. So we got one and coupled it to our operating microscope so that everything that was being done was automatically recorded. This was an excellent medium because I could study the effects of laser and its parameters on biological tissue frame by frame, which gives me an insight to adjust the parameters, the power setting, the exposure time to suit the tissue for ablation or cutting. These bench experiments are recorded and they are available on the YouTube. 
So in this series, we study how the understanding of light in the last four centuries led us to the concept of lasers. How we developed the very first laser in the UK for its application to the ENT surgery, mainly the oropharynx and the larynx. I hope you find this series useful and enjoy as much as I did doing experiments in 1982. Thank you. We start with basic physics of light. What is light? Our body perceives many sensations such as touch, smell and taste. Light is one such sensation and it is perceived by our eyes. But in physics, the light means electromagnetic radiation. We can only see a small part of it. Most of it is not visible to our eyes. How does the sun generate light? The electromagnetic radiation originates in the sun. The sun is a ball of plasma. In physics, plasma is not the same as it is in medicine. Plasma in physics is a state of matter in which gases energize until atomic electrons are no longer associated with specific atomic nuclei. It consists of positively charged ions and unbound electrons. Plasma can be generated by heating a gas until it is ionized or subjecting it to a strong electromagnetic field. The nuclear fusion takes place in the core of the sun between hydrogen and helium. Massive amount of heat is generated. It takes thousands of years for the heat to come to the surface of the sun. The heat is then radiated from the surface of the sun into the outer space in the form of an electromagnetic radiation. There are many natural sources of light. The most important one is, of course, the sun. Other natural sources of light are lightning in the sky, fireflies, wildfires, and so on. But apart from natural sources of light, we also make light artificially. For example, we have wind turbines which convert wind energy into electricity, which we use it for street lighting and many other applications. Okay, we now know that the electromagnetic radiation comes from the sun. But how does it reach us? The radiation from the sun spreads in all directions. It travels to us in the vacuum of the outer space and reaches our atmosphere some eight and a half minutes later. In the atmosphere, most of the ultraviolet rays are absorbed. The radiation then falls on the earth, which lights up and we see the world around us. When the atmosphere is clear, the sun rays light up the earth directly and we call it sunshine. We feel the direct sun rays as warmth on our body due to the infrared rays of the spectrum. But our eyes cannot see them. We detect them as the warmth in the sun rays. On a cloudy day, some of the sun rays, including the infrared rays, are absorbed by the cloud and scatter in all directions. We call the reflected sun rays as sunlight, which does not have the same amount of warmth as the sunshine. In this photo, 
we see the sun with its radiant energy casting luminous rays that enter our eyes. But our planet Earth is not luminous. We see it because the sun's rays interact with it, absorbing some and reflecting others. It is the reflected rays which enter our eyes and produce visual sensation of the world around us. The various shades of the colors that emerge from this interaction makes the earth so colorful. The reflected light enters our eyes. In the back of our eyes, we have retina. Retina consists of photosensitive cells. They are known as rods and cones. Rods respond to low lighting conditions, for example, at night. They are thus essential for night vision as they can be activated by just a few photons. However, since rods do not respond to colors, we see dimly lit objects around us as various shades of gray, depending upon the availability of lighting intensity. The human eye has over 100 million rod cells. Cones are activated only when there is a high intensity of light around us, such as during the day. They also respond to colors, hence the world we see around us in the daylight is so colorful. The cones respond to what we call primary colors, red, green and blue. The varying amount of light intensity makes other colors. There are about 6 million cones. They are concentrated around the fovea, which is a central area of the retina and contribute to the sharpness of the image. We have now studied that the electromagnetic radiation originates in the sun and travels to us in an outer space. We now look at the electromagnetic radiation. Let us assume that a point in space is represented by an arrow. At any one point, the red arrow is the electric field direction and the blue arrow at the same point is the magnetic field direction which is perpendicular to the electric field direction. The mutual interaction of electric and magnetic fields produces an electromagnetic disturbance which propagates in space and time in a direction perpendicular to these two fields. In classical physics, the electromagnetic radiation is represented as waves. Hence, in everyday life, we have radio waves, microwaves, and so on. But in quantum mechanics, they are represented as photons or packets of energy with no mass but momentum, which gives them velocity described later. The electromagnetic radiation like that emitted from broadcasting stations, such as the BBC, propagates through the atmosphere in the form of radio waves. When a car's antenna picks up these radio waves, it serves as a receiver and transmits the signal to the car's radio. The radio then amplifies the signal, the speakers convert it into the audio signal, which we hear of the BBC radio program. The electromagnetic spectrum refers to the range of all possible electromagnetic radiations. It includes various types of waves or particles that carry energy through space. The spectrum thus covers a wide range of wavelengths or frequencies from extremely long radio waves two very short gamma rays. We experience visual sensation when specific frequencies and specific energy cause a chemical reaction in the cells of our retina. 
We call these frequencies the visible spectrum. Rods in the retina are sensitive to the intensity of the light, whereas cones are sensitive to specific colors. Some colors are considered primary, since mixing those colors make secondary colors. It's important to note that the concept of primary colors can vary according to the context in which they are used. For example, in television and computer screens, the primary colors are red and green and blue, whereas in printing, the primary colors are cyan, magenta, and yellow. This slide shows how we get new colors by mixing primary colors, red, green, and blue. Although we see seven colors, it doesn't mean that every species would perceive the same colors as we do. The perception of color depends upon the peculiarity of the cells which make up their retina. Bees see a lot more shades of blue than we do. Dogs see only yellow and blue. We now consider the invisible part of the spectrum. Specific instruments and technologies are designed to detect and measure invisible radiation. These instruments convert the invisible radiation into signals and images that scientists, engineers, and medical professionals can observe, analyze, and interpret. As we have noted, our eyes are sensitive only to a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum known as the visible light. It ranges from 400 to 700 nanometer. Beyond 700 nanometer, we have infrared range of light. It ranges from 700 nanometer to 1 million nanometer, but we cannot see infrared rays. However, we can feel their presence as warmth on our body. They can also be detected by converting them into a visible spectrum. You can do this little experiment at home. Hold your mobile camera in front of the aperture for the infrared beam of your remote control of the television. The camera converts the infrared beam into a visible white light as seen here in this experiment. The ultraviolet range is divided into UVA, UVB, and UVC. UVC is mostly absorbed by the atmosphere. Both UVA and UVB reach the surface of the Earth. The damaging effects of UV radiations are primarily due to their ability to cause molecular changes in the biological tissue and the DNA. The exposure can cause sunburn, skin aging, eye damage, and of course, skin cancer. The degree of damage depends on the intensity and the duration of exposure, the skin type, the use of protective measures such as the sun cream and sunglasses. Three hours of morning walk in April in Atlanta caused this kind of damage to my face, which took seven years to clear. While we cannot see these wavelengths directly, we do make use of them extensively in everyday life. For example, radio waves are used for various forms of communications. The microwaves are used for cooking, the infrared radiation is used in thermal imaging. The ultraviolet radiation is used in forensic investigation, counterfeit detection, and sterilization. X-rays are used for examination of various structures of the body, particularly the hard, dense bones. And gamma rays are used in radiotherapy to treat cancer.
But from the previous slides, it is clear that the radiation in the form of waves consists of energy. The amount of energy in each wave is determined by its frequency and amplitude. The higher the frequency and the amplitude, the more the energy the wave has. High energy waves are known as ionizing radiations, whereas low energy waves are known as non-ionizing radiation. Let us now see what makes radiation an ionizing radiation. When radiation has enough energy to remove tightly bound electrons from atoms and molecules, it results in ionization. Ionization results in the formation of charged particles called ions. Ionization process can have various effects depending on the type and intensity of the radiation and, of course, the nature of matter being irradiated. Ionizing radiation has an important role to play in medicine, in imaging, for example, in x-rays and scans, and also in cancer treatment. In this context, careful control and precision delivery of the radiation are essential to balance the benefit and the risk of these procedures. In 1895, German physicist William Röntgen discovered the X-rays. The waves pass through the less dense medium such as muscles and skin, but not through the bones, which are more dense. The bones absorb the beam, which made them stand out against the surrounding substructures. This X-ray of the shoulder joint shows fracture. Incidentally, do you know why radiographers wear lead aprons? Because the lead absorbs X-rays and minimizes the dose to their own body. In radiotherapy for the treatment of cancer, ionizing gamma rays are used. They act directly or by creating reactive oxygen species that damage the DNA. The damaged cells die either by direct cell death or by a process called apoptosis where the cell is programmed to self-destruct. The radiation can also cause damage to the blood vessels that supply the tumor, depriving it of oxygen and nutrients, which then leads to the cell death. We now look at the non-ionizing radiation spectrum. This spectrum consists of low frequency ultraviolet rays, visible light, infrared, microwave, and the radio waves. The non-ionizing radiation in the low frequency range do not have enough energy to ionize atoms or molecules. These radiations are used in a number of everyday applications. For examples include microwaves to heat food, lighting for vision, radio signals for communication, and infrared radiation for remote control of television and such. This slide summarizes how we use the whole range of the electromagnetic spectrum. In the center of the slide, we have visible light with ultraviolet and infrared rays on either side. In high frequency, high energy range, we have gamma rays for radiotherapy and X-rays for imaging. In the low frequency, low energy range, we have infrared television communication control, microwave, and radio waves. When a ball drops into the water, it causes waves. 
waves spread around as disturbance, but the ball does not move. Each wave has a high point crest and a low point trough. We now study the light wave under two headings. The parameters of light describe its numerical or other measurable factors. The properties describe the various ways in which the light behaves when it interacts with matter. The parameters are wavelength, amplitude, frequency, energy, period, and speed, whereas properties are absorption, reflection, scatter, refraction, diffraction, and transmission. A wave is represented as a sine wave. The wavelength is a distance between two identical points. Amplitude is a vertical excursion from direction of propagation. And frequency is the number of oscillations per second. Absorption and reflection are the basic phenomena. We see the moon because the sun rays falling on its surface are reflected and enter our eyes. We see the world around us because of scattering. Scattering occurs when light interacts with particles in the atmosphere and scatters randomly. There are two types of scattering, Rayleigh scattering and May scattering. Rayleigh scattering occurs when light waves interact with particles that are much smaller than the wavelength of the light, such as air molecules. The effect of Rayleigh scattering is stronger at shorter wavelengths, which is why blue light scatters more than other wavelengths, making the sky appear blue during the day. May scattering occurs when light interacts with larger particles in the atmosphere, such as water droplets in the cloud or mist. All colors of the light are scattered equally, making the cloud appear white. This photo shows both Rayleigh scattering and May scattering. Rayleigh scattering causes sky to appear blue, whereas May scattering makes the mist appear white. When the light passes from one medium to the other, it bends. This effect is called refraction. Some rays reflect inside the water droplet and refract from the same side. Each wavelength refracts at a different angle, producing the seven colors of the rainbow. Most refraction takes place at an angle of deviation, which is about 40 degrees. All droplets which refract at this angle form a circular arc. But we see only half of the arc, which is above the horizon. The other half is below the horizon. When the light encounters an obstacle or a narrow opening, it bends. This property of the light is known as diffraction. It is due to the wave's interference with itself as it passes through an obstacle or an aperture. In this photo, as the sun rises, some of the rays at the horizon bend and makes the sun appear in front of the horizon. The bent rays in the photo are seen to make circles around the sun. 
the transmission of light depends on the optical property of matter and also on the wavelength. In this example, the optical properties of the windscreen allows full transmission of the visible light. But in the first photo, the fog blocks the view of the road ahead. Whereas in the second photo, on a clear day, the visibility is infinite. When all the waves are in phase, the interference is constructive where the resultant wave is much larger. But when all the waves are out of phase, the interference is destructive where the resultant wave is much shallower. As we have seen, the light waves travel in a vacuum of the outer space. Here, a speed is fastest in the whole of the universe at 186,000 miles per second or 300,000 kilometers a second or 300 million meters per second. At this speed, the light will go around the Earth seven and a half times in just one second. Now you know, when you tap a wrong key on your mobile to call someone, say in the USA, the signal has already reached its destination before you realize your error. We have now reached a historical landmark where the light is considered as having sometimes as a wave property and sometime as a particle property. A concept known as wave particle duality. This concept led us to development of the laser technology. Let us now consider if light is a wave. In 1690, the Dutch scientist Christian Eugens described that many of the properties of light may be interpreted as if it propagates as a wave. However, Sir Isaac Newton, the English scientist, provided an alternative theory that light is composed of tiny discrete corpuscles or particles. This view prevailed over the wave theory until, in 1801, the English physicist Thomas Young did his now classic double slit experiment described in the next few slides. The double slit experiment is a classic experiment in quantum mechanics. It supports the theory of wave particle duality which states that all matter has both wave-like and particle-like properties. It consists of an electron gun, a double slit board, and a detector board. Once through the slits, they have a choice where to fall on the detector board. The classical double slit experiment confirms a wave-like property of the particles. The photoelectric effect. In 1887, the German scientist Hertz observed that shining blue light on metal electrodes caused a change in voltage at which sparking occurred. This correlation of light and electricity is known as the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is dependent upon the frequency and also the intensity of light. In 1905, Einstein explained the photoelectric effect. Einstein postulated that the energy in light existed as packets or quanta. The electrons received the energy 
from the electromagnetic field in discrete quanta later called photons. Einstein was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1921 for his discovery of the law of photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect depends on the frequency as well as the energy level of the incident light. Potassium requires an energy of 2 electrovolt to eject electrons. The red wavelength emitting at 700 nanometer frequency has only 1.77 electrovolt energy and therefore it does not result in emission of electrons. On the other hand, ultraviolet energy emitting at 400 nanometer frequency with 3.1 electron volt energy results in emission of electron from the block of potassium. The potassium atom corresponds to a green wavelength of about 540 nanometers. The wave particle duality is a cornerstone of quantum mechanics and has important implications in our understanding of lasers. In support of the wave particle duality, Albert Einstein wrote, it seems as though we must use sometimes the one theory and sometimes the other, while at times we may use either. We are faced with a new kind of difficulty. We have two contradictory pictures of reality. Separately, neither of them fully explain the phenomenon of light, but together they do. Through the work of Max Planck, Albert Einstein, Louis de Broglie, Arthur Crompton, Niels Bohr, Erwin Schrödinger, and many others, current scientific theory holds that all matter exhibits wave-like nature as well as particle-like nature at the same time. This phenomenon has been verified not only for elementary particles but also for compound particles like atoms or even molecules. However, for macroscopic particles, because of their extremely short wavelengths, wave properties usually cannot be detected. We have already seen how light energy behaves as a wave. The next few slides cover the light energy in the form of particles or photons. To recap, light travels as a wave, while its energy travels as particles known as photons. We have studied the properties of light as a wave. Now, let us study the properties of its energy photons as particles. A photon is a packet of energy known as quantum. A photon has no rest mass. Its massless state means that it is not deflected by other forces. However, gravity does affect its direction of travel. A photon has no electric charge. Therefore, it does not interact with other particles through the strong or weak nuclear forces and can pass through matter with relative ease. Although photons are massless particles, they still contain energy which can be converted into kinetic energy which in turn imparts them velocity. Photon energy comes from the electromagnetic field of charged particles such as electrons and protons. When these particles interact, they produce photons which carry energy away from the interaction. Photon energy is proportional to the frequency of the electromagnetic waves. Therefore, 
higher frequency rays such as gamma rays have higher energy and they are destructive whereas longer frequency rays such as radio waves have less energy and therefore they are not destructive. Light is energy. The energy reacts with matter known as interaction. We have studied the properties of light. Now we need to study the properties of matter. We then will be able to understand how light energy interacts with matter to produce a different kind of result. An atom consists of a small, dense nucleus. It is made up of positively charged protons and uncharged neutrons with a cloud of negatively charged electrons surrounding it. The number of protons determines the atomic number and therefore its identity as a specific element. The number of neutrons vary creating the isotopes of that element. The electrons in an atom occupy different energy levels or orbitals. The arrangement of these electrons determines the atom's chemical properties and how it interacts with other atoms. Electrons spin in a cloud around the nucleus. We now look at the energy levels of the electrons in an atom. The electrons can have only certain specific energies. These energies are called electron energy levels or states. They are represented as a series of stacked horizontal lines or as concentric circles shown here. Normally, electrons spin around the nucleus in the lowest energy level nearest to the nucleus. This level is called the ground state level. An electron can gain energy and move up the energy level if it absorbs enough energy either by collisions with other atoms or electrons, by absorbing a photon, or by absorbing energy from a physical source such as an electric pump. These higher energy levels are discrete, much like rungs of a ladder. Electrons must jump to the next discrete energy level. They cannot occupy any level between these discrete energy levels. If an electron gains enough energy, it is ejected from the atom. This is known as ionization as described earlier. An excited electron emits energy in the form of a photon and returns to a stable ground level. When the energy strikes matter, it reacts by a process of absorption and becomes unstable. It must either use it or emit it back into space by the process of emission. We now look at these two processes, absorption and emission. We have now established that light has energy in the form of particles called photons. When the light strikes matter, its energy in the form of photon is absorbed by that matter. Matter is thus energized and becomes unstable. It must now lose this energy and go back to its normal stable state. The two processes whereby the energy reacts with matter are described as absorption and emission. Photons emitted by excited electron 
are free to travel randomly in any direction, polarization, and phase. This is known as spontaneous emission. For example, all light emitted by an electric bulb is due to spontaneous emission. We have now seen that the matter absorbs light energy and emits it as photons. This emission is random, meaning the emitted photons travel in any direction, polarization, and phase. This is spontaneous emission. But there is another kind of emission known as stimulated emission. Stimulated emission forms the very basis of laser technology. And therefore, we study that next. When a photon with the same energy and phase interacts with the excited atom, it can trigger the atom to undergo an emission of photons with the same directionality and polarization. The process by which two identical photons are emitted is known as stimulated emission. Here is an example of two different kinds of emission. The emission from the floodlight is spontaneous emission, where photons travel randomly in any direction, polarization, and phase. On the other hand, the light from the laser shows stimulated emission, where photons travel in the same direction with the same polarity and phase. We now got stimulated emission. But what would happen if the stimulated emission is further energized with an external energy source? Well, that is how the laser beam is formed. So let us study further this particular phenomena. There is one name that is indelibly associated with the laser technology and that is Albert Einstein. As we have seen, Einstein's work on the quantum nature of the light and energy was essential in understanding the physics of lasers and his theories were the basis for many of the optical and electrical components used in modern laser technology. We are now in a position to understand the basic laser construction. The next few slides demonstrate this. Laser is an acronym which stands for Light Amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. L for light. In physics, all radiation is loosely covered by the term light. A for amplification. Amplification is provided by the laser tube. S for stimulated. Energy for stimulation of the light is provided by the pump energy. E for emission, stimulated electrons emit photons. R for radiation, emitted photons have the same direction, phase, and polarization. This is laser light. Let us now look at the parts of the laser. An optical resonator or optical cavity is a tube which consists of two or more mirrors placed in such a way that light is reflected back and forth between them, creating a standing wave pattern. This results in amplification of electromagnetic waves of a specific frequency. By altering the parameters of the tube, light can be tuned to a desired frequency. 
the gain medium. The gain medium is the material inside the optical tube. It is typically a gas, crystal, or a semiconductor, which can amplify light by stimulated emission. Stimulated emission of photons from the gain medium is the fundamental process that produces laser light. The pump energy. The pump source is the part of the laser which supplies energy to the laser system. The source may be electrical discharges, flash lamps, arc lamps, or indeed a light from another laser. The energy is absorbed by the atoms in the gain medium and then they jump to a higher energy level. When the population of excited atoms in the higher energy level exceeds that in the lower energy level, a state of population inversion is achieved. Population inversion is a basic preliminary requirement for the laser emission in which all the photons have the same directionality, polarization, and they are in phase. The laser operation. When the population of photons in the population inversion state reaches a threshold, a small amount of light passes through the partially reflective mirror. This is the laser beam. It is monochromatic with all the photons traveling in the same direction with the same polarity and they are in phase. The first operating laser was built by Theodore Maiman from UGES Research Laboratories in Malibu, California in 1960 with ruby crystal as a gain medium. Section 1 ends here. Let us summarize what we studied in Section 1. The light travels as electromagnetic radiation but it also contains energy. The energy in an electromagnetic radiation is transmitted as small packets of energy called quanta. These are also known as photons. When an electron spinning at the ground level is energized with an external energy source, it jumps to a higher energy level. Here, it is unstable. It therefore emits its energy as photon and decays to a stable ground level. This type of emission is known as spontaneous emission. But if an electron already at a higher energy level is further energized, it jumps to an even higher energy level. Here, it emits one photon and also an additional identical photon. The two photons are in phase and have the same directionality and polarization. This type of emission is known as stimulated emission. Stimulated emission forms the basis of the generation of a laser beam. The laser consists of an external energy source, a laser medium, and an optical resonator. The main component of the laser is a gain medium. It is also known as an active medium since it can achieve population inversion where enough atoms or molecules are in an excited state to allow stimulated emission to dominate. The optical resonator is a cavity which consists of a pair of highly reflective mirrors placed parallel to each other at the ends of an active medium. Light bounces back and forth between those mirrors, gaining intensity with each pass through the gain medium. When a certain threshold is reached, where number of electrons or atoms in the upper energy level exceed 
those in the lower energy level, a state of population inversion is achieved. Population inversion is a prerequisite to the generation of a laser beam. One mirror is fully reflective, whereas the other is partially reflective. It allows a small amount of light to escape from the cavity. This is the laser beam. The laser light has some unique properties. Laser light is coherent, meaning all of these individual waves are in step or in phase with one another at every point. The laser light is collimated, meaning all the waves in a beam travel in the same direction. And the laser light is highly monochromatic, meaning it is made of a single color or a very narrow range of wavelength of that color. It has a very high intensity. It vaporizes the tissue and also seals blood vessels at the same time. When I used it for the first time to remove a tumor from the patient's tongue, it made news headlines, as you would say, in this BBC news recording of 1983. Well, still with uh, things medical, leading surgeons from many parts of Britain and overseas have gathered in Cleveland this week for the country's first conference on a new field of laser surgery. Techniques being pioneered at Middlesbrough's North Riding Infirmary are attracting worldwide interest in the treatment of throat cancer. And it's all been made possible by the generosity of Cleveland people who raised nearly £70,000 in record time to pay for a revolutionary laser machine. This report from Alan Powell. The North Riding Infirmary got its new carbon dioxide laser less than six months after a public appeal was launched in March of last year. It's been in use for the past ten months and in that time more than a hundred patients have benefited from a tool that takes surgery into the 21st century. The surgery is nearly bloodless, uh, bloodless to the extent that there is not a red spot around during the surgery. The recovery from the surgery is very quick. The hospitalization is short. The patient after this kind of surgery can perhaps go home second day, third day, they have gone home second or third day, and this is following a major excision uh, of uh, the uh, tissues in the larynx and uh, on the tongue and the floor of the mouth. Uh, painless, certainly the surgery is remarkably painless after the operation. The patients hardly need any analgesics or that's the pain-killing substances after the operation. So uh, the advances are both for the surgeon and for the patient. The laser, therefore, is not a cure in itself, but a spectacular use of an intensified light beam to cut away tumours either malignant or benign. The beam can be focused to a fraction of a millimetre, literally evaporating tissue. And the aftermath is almost equally dramatic. A few weeks after the removal of a fairly large growth, only a small scar is visible. If this tool is new, I think we should find out what exactly it does and what exactly it cannot do. Therefore, the objective of the conference is to discuss and share our experiences with uh, people from the rest of this country or Europe and America. And uh, at the end of the day, I hope that this particular tool will find its rightful place in the armamentarium that we have uh, to deal uh, cases of cancer or any other lesions in the mouth and larynx. Does this mean that there's some resistance within the medical profession to using it? Well, there is always a core um, of people who uh, perhaps don't want to change the, the ideas. Uh, perhaps they feel that it's a new technology. Let me see how it develops. Um, yes, there's always a core. On the other hand, once they come to a conference, see the results, then perhaps they would want uh, to, to go home and uh, find uh, if they could find In the next section, we will study the properties and parameters of the CO2 laser and its interaction in biological tissue with the help of some bench experiments carried out in 1982.
thank you.